Okay, well, welcome everyone. I think we'll uh, get started now. So thanks everyone for coming uh, in person. Thanks for joining online and welcome if you're watching on YouTube after the fact. So I'm James Doan from M-Cubed and it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Chow Yang, who's uh, here from uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Uh, just before I get started, um, just wanted to remind everyone that we have a half hour social, uh, optional social from 3 till 3.30. So the coffee and cookies will stay out there to have some time to interact with people. So yeah, welcome Chow, good to have you. Um, so a bit on Chow's background. So he did his PhD at the Courant Institute at New York University in 2017 with Andrew Maida and then stuck around for a few years as a postdoc studying scale interactions in the tropics. Uh, since then, he moved to um, PNL or PNNL in two, 2020, where he works with uh, Rubelong and colleagues studying MCSs. And that's what he's going to talk about today, MCSs in a warming world. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. First, I would like to thank Chris, Rich, and James for giving me this great opportunity to visit NCAR, MCUBE. Um, I feel uh, lucky to be here in April because the weather and the landscape now in Boulder is so nice. Uh, yeah, so about me, I'm currently a research, research scientist at the uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. This fall, I'm going to join the faculty at Peking University Today, I'm going to present my recent studies about the impact of global warming on U.S. summertime mesoscale convective systems, particularly from a simple Lagrangian puzzle model perspective. Let me first tell you why we got interest in this topic. In the literature, it has been known for a long time that there exists a long-standing model dry bias in simulating the summertime central U.S. Here, I'm going to show you one, one specific example. This map is from the uh, Liu et al.'s paper. And here, the color shows you the June, July, August precipitation bias between the WOF model and observation. And now, if you look at the, this map, particularly over the central US, there exists, so the red color means dry bias, less precipitation than the observation. Then you see in the, over the central US, the, this dry bias is as large as more than 100 millimeter, which is about one third of the actual uh, observed precipitation amount. So this is quite surprising. Why, why the, the model like the state of our model like a wolf significantly underestimated the precipitation over that area? What is missing? The model must missing some critical thing or poorly represent some uh, key uh, process. So let me, now let me show you the other uh, fact. So this figure is from uh, Form et al.'s paper. And uh, in this figure, they shows you, so what they do is they're using some M MCS tracking algorithm to track the MCS. And then they can, um, they can separate the precipitation that is released by the MCS and uh, from those uh, from non-MCS. So they can calculate the fraction of MCS precipitation in total. And it turns out that over the central US, such a fraction is as large as more than 50%. So in other words, MCS as a major rain producer over that area. So this is from the observational uh, perspective. The right panel is from the, the, the modeling results. Praying at all, they, they're using the WOLF simulation and they find out that the WOLF significantly underestimated the MCS tracks over the same area. And you can see that such area is as large as more than 30%. So now, if we put all these three uh, facts together, it's very easy to come up uh, with a hypothesis. We notice that this uh, big model dry bias over the central US, and we know MCS are the major rain producer, but it's underestimated in WOLF, then it's very likely that the, the inadequate treatment of MCS is responsible for the model dry, dry bias. So, so I guess um, it's natural to give, give such a, uh, come up with such a hypothesis, but it's very... Let me interrupt you. What kind of regulatory resolutions are used for, for those sort of data? 
so for the wolf simulation, it's a four kilometer uh, resolution, yeah. So, so now we must admit that it's very hard to validate such hypothesis because in the model, model world, you can't just tune the model to have less or more MCS without changing other conditions. So how to investigate such hypothesis would be a, a very difficult task, but at least we can get some hints from the existing results. So next I'm going to show you some uh, other results uh, from the super parameterized E3 SM. So here on the top three panel, the left one showing you the number of MCS per season from the observation, this is the panel D, and the red panel is from the E3SM, the original version of E3SM. You can see it's significantly underestimated the MCS numbers, but the super parameterized E3SM has some improvement compared with the, 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 uh, the red panel. So we can see super parameterized E3SM has uh, it's natural to understand that because it's better resolve the convection on each grid, so it's, it has a better chance to uh, give uh, better MCS numbers. So next, the bottom panel shows you the total precipitation. Again, the left panel is for the observation, right panel is for E3SM. You can see the original E3SM has some large model bias, but the super parameterized E3SM has some improvement, but it's still uh, far from satisfactory. But at least based on these results, we know that super parameterized version of E3SM can better resolve convection, particularly about the MCS, then it's, it's, it's more likely for the model to better resolve the total precipitation. Of course, this is just a very rough uh, discussion. It's not rigorously uh, investigation, but the, I guess what I just try to emphasize is that if, you, if the model can better resolve the MCS, then it's, there is a better chance to better resolve the total precipitation. So since I, I suppose you all agree with me that now MCS are a very important thing, and we need to have a better understanding about its physical mechanisms, so this panel shows you a few snapshots about MCS during its life cycle. So in the initial uh, stage, MCS looks like a uh, very small scale scattered convection. Then after a few hours, those unorganized scale, uh, scattered convection will gradually aggregate, aggregate together and forms a very large scale cluster. And this process is called upscale growth feature. Then in the mature stage, the MCS could grow into a size into more than 100 kilometers, at least in one direction. And after mature stage, it will just decay gradually. Uh, but the, we know that if we want to have a better prediction, it's the, the, the initial stage of the MCS life cycle is uh, very important because you want to predict its onset. So that's why in our study, we are mostly focusing on the two early stages of MCS life cycle. The first is the convective initia initiation stage where you see a lot of scattered small-scale convection. Second stage is the MCS genesis stage when those scattered convection gradually Aggregate, aggregate together and forms a large scale cloud cluster. So this is the two stage we are mostly interested in. And I just write down the goals of our study. We want to um, develop a simple models for convective initiation and MCS genesis stages. And after we obtain those or develop those models, we want to use those models to investigate the impact of global warming on MCS initiation. Um, I guess some of you might wonder since you want to investigate MCS, why don't you use a better, more complicated cloud resolving simulations because they can give you more realistic results. So uh, here our purpose is that we want to isolate a bare bone mechanism. What is uh, the top one or top two mechanism that, that is responsible for the MCS life cycle? So our purpose is to get some quantity, uh, qualitatively uh, uh, results. That's why we turn to uh, develop such a simple models. So I guess this is the end of the introduction. Now I'm going to go, go through the results about this stage. First, part one will be about the convective initiation. Part two will be about MCS genesis. So convective initiation stage in a single column Lagrange parcel model. Um, by definition, a single column Lagrange parcel model means that you consider a column uh, domain and uh, inside the domain, we suppose there is a thermal uh, parcel which could be released from the low level, and under some 
uh, buoyancy effects, it will gradually rise to the upper and upper levels. And uh, of course, during its uh, rising trajectory, you need to consider lots of uh, relevant physical process. For example, you need to consider the phase change between the water vapor and the liquid water, as well as the precipitation. Now also, you need to consider the mass ex uh, exchange between the parcel and the environment. That's the entrainment process. You also need to consider the, the, the momentum budget, uh, uh, budget between the buoyancy, gravity, and the drag. So after we incorporate all these physical processes and put them together into a simple model, we are actually able to uh, describe the, 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 the rising trajectory of the puzzle. So next, next, I'm going to just very briefly introduce you or describe you the, what, how, how does the model looks like. So the model is actually based on uh, David Rums and Zhiming Kuang's paper, and we, we use that model and modify in a few aspects to fit our purpose. And if you look at the, the, the model or the equations, it's very simple. It's only consistent of seven equations with very clear physical uh, uh, interpretations. And the model is basically about the budget of the, those conserved quantity of the parcel, including the total mass, total water vapor mass, total liquid water mass, total vertical momentum budget, and the fifth line is about the vertical disp displacement. It's just definition the, of the vertical velocity of the parcel. And the sixth line is for the total energy. And the model is closed by uh, incorpor incorporating the ideal gas law. So now if you look at those governing equations on the left-hand side, they are just time tendency of those qu conserved quantity. And uh, on the right-hand side, of course, you need to include a lot of uh, relevant physical process forcing. Uh, so here I'm just, just going to go through them very briefly and quickly, and I just highlight uh, some uh, very important terms. For example, in the mass conservation or budget equations, on the right-hand side, you see precipitation will behave like a mass loss, a mass sink, and entrainment will behave like a mass source. And on the equation for the water vapor mass, you need the, the evaporation will, will, will serve as a, a uh, mass, uh, mass think, and uh, the entrainment again is served as a uh, mass source. Um, then, then those, the third equation for liquid water mass, the fourth equation for vertical uh, momentum on the right hand side, we consider the gravity, we consider the buoyancy due to the uh, environmental pressure gradient, and also the third term is for the momentum loss due to the uh, uh, rain fallout. And the last uh, term is about the atmosphere drag, the friction. Then in the equation for the total energy on the right-hand side, you, see, you can see this term is for the energy gain due to the uh, buoyancy, and second term is, is uh, uh, the work done by the parcel to the environment when its volume uh, expands. The third term is the energy loss due to the uh, rain fallout. The fourth term is for the energy, energy source or energy gain due to the entrainment. And the last term is energy loss due to the, uh, the atmosphere drag. So, so, um, so this is a very brief introduction, but I guess the take-home message is the model is starting, is, is starting from the first principle uh, assumptions, and uh, the, you, after you include those conserved quantity, uh, it's supposed to describe uh, the, the some uh, intuitively realistic feature when the parcel rises from the lower level to the upper levels. So without any further explanation, I'm, going just, I'm just going to show you the, uh, the solutions. So the next slide just shows a few time series about the parcel, the variables related to the parcel, and the x axis for time. So here it's about 40 minutes. The first panel shows you the height of the parcel. As you can see we initially um, release the parcel from the low level or near the two kilometers. And then under the buoyancy, the parcel will keep rise to the upper and upper level. When it reaches the equilibrium level, it just oscillate above the level and dissipated gradually. Second panel is for the mass. You can see the parcel mass keeps increasing. This is simply due to the entrainment. And third panel is for the specific humidity of the parcel. You can see the parcel moisture is a blue curve. It's slightly larger than the red curve. The red curve is the saturation of humidity. In other words, when the parcel rises to the upper level, it, it stays in the state of the uh, super saturation. So that's why the rain keeps coming out. 
So if you look at the right last panel, that's for the precipitation rate. So you see when the parcel releases from the in initial level, the precipitation keeps uh, occurs and uh, it reaches its peak intensity at the 12 minutes. So I, I suppose everyone will agree with me that such kind of a model output looks quite intuitively, uh, well, I would say intuitively correct because it describes how you how the parcel would behave when, when it goes to the upper levels under the buoyancy. But uh, you might wonder, uh, the model is quite simple, how, how useful is that? How can we apply such a simple model to un answer the real world questions? Uh, so the first thing we do is we discuss, use this single, simple column model to discuss the, the, the uh, diurnal cycle convection. So what do we do is we're focusing on the central US area as outlined by the yellow box, and uh, we're taking average about the uh, uh, environmental profile, including the temperature and mo moisture, and uh, uh, we use that environmental profile to drive our single column model. So you will see the single column model is simply uh, driven by the uh, imposed environmental temperature and moisture profile, and it will tell you how would the parcel uh, behave. So in other words, you can think of this puzzle as a prop. You, you have, you impose some environmental profile, it tells you how would the prop, the puzzle behave. And uh, uh, in other words, the model can basically describe the impact of thermal dynamic profiles on the, on the uh, in, uh, influencing the convection. So now, the, this panel is a histodiagram. diagram the x axis is a different local time. So what do we do is we calculate the mean environmental profile at each uh, specific local time. And if we first look at the purple bar, the purple bar shows the total number of observed convective initiation events. So this is from the observation, and you can see the observation, the, those convective initiation events reach its peak out number near uh, about the 3 p.m. in the local, local time. And the, now if we look at the green bar, green bar is the final height of the parcel. So we, again, I just repeat, we impose the mean uh, environmental profile to drive our single column model, and it will tell you what's the final height of the parcel. And it turns out that the single column model also predict that on the, in the early afternoon, about the 3 p.m., the height of the parcel will reach its maximum uh, value. Um, so, I must admit that the, these two quantity, the number of observed con convective initiation and the final height of parcel are totally different variables, but uh, roughly speaking, they both tell us how favorable are the environmental profiles. So I would, uh, would say at least our single color model can predict that uh, um, the, at the early afternoon, about 3 p.m., it's more favorable condition for convection, and it's some kind of consistent with the early afternoon peak of a convection from the observation. So, so these kind of results give us some encouraging, uh, this, this encouraging result give us some, some confidence that our model is quite simple, but at least it can capture some leading other behavior from the observation. So I guess now we suppose the model is good enough to capture some uh, uh, other one behavior. Now we are going to apply such model to answer the questions related, related with the global warming. So um, this slide is about the changes in mean precipitation under the warming. And uh, next I'm going to, to explain to you how do we do this. It's, quite, it's a little bit complicated. But the, if you look at the left panel, what do we do is we, for each one degree by one degree uh, place, we taking we taking a 14 years period from the current climate. It's from the 2004 to 2017, and the summertime, June, July, August, and hourly environmental profile, including both temperature and moisture, and use that to drive our single column model. And our single column model will tell you what is the precipitation amount. So basically, we have a 14 years summertime hourly environmental profile to drive. The model, model gives you lots of uh, results about the precipitation amount, and we can calculate the mean precipitation under the current climate. So then for the future climate, we are taking the so-called pseudo-global warming approach. Again, we are using the uh, hourly environmental profile for each one degree by one degree uh, place, uh, uh, spot, and uh, 
plus a mean climate perturbation projected by the simplify model. So it's still EIA5 in 1.5. The only difference is we are adding a, 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 a fixed future climate perturbation projected by the simplify model. So then again, we can calculate the mean precipitation under the future climate. Then we can ca ca calculate the difference. So basically, this panel shows you the future mean precipitation change uh, between the current climate and future climate. And you will see the, our, our simple model predict that over the central US, there should be a mean precipitation, precipitation decrease and uh, an increase to its east. An interesting result we find is we, if we directly looking at the simplify model here, so the right panel is directly calculated uh, by the output from the simplify model, and which also shows a, 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 a very clear mean precipitation decrease over the central US and the increase to its east and east, east south uh, part of the US. Uh, so this, this shows that uh, our simple model can be used to um, predict the mean precipitation change under the warming. Of course, we need to admit that these two panels, uh, there are a lot of difference between them. For example, those anomalies and also the locations, it seems those anomalies slightly shift to the eastward. Um, but the, so I guess what we want to uh, argue is that by simply incorporating the thermal dynamic environmental profile, including the temperature and moisture, and uh, our simple model is already capable to capture the leading other behavior. Of course, if you can, um, and those difference might be attributed to the uh, dynamical factor or other things. But the, what we, the take home message is that by solely relying on the thermal dynamic environmental profile, the such a single column model is able to predict this mean precipitation decrease. All right, so this is about the mean precipitation. Next, I'm going to talk about a convective population. So, uh, so if you still remember, when we calculate uh, in the previous slide, what we do is we choose in the 14 years period, uh, June, July, August, we have hourly uh, precipitation amount. So besides the mean precipitation, we can also plot its, its uh, histogram. So here, x axis for the precipitation amount, hourly precipitation amount, and it is a histogram blue bar is for the, from the current climate, and the red bar is, is based on the, is for the future climate. Now, if you com compare the red, red bar, uh, the, the blue bar and the red bar, you can find out that for those weak to the moderate precipitation events, you see a frequency decrease under the future, under the warming, but the, there's an increase for the, those strong precipitation events. Um, such change in the convective population is actually consistent with uh, results based on more, more complicated model. For example, Rasmussen et al. They used the uh, uh, WOLF simulation and they, found, they concluded with a similar results. They found out that there, there should be a decreasing weak to the moderate convection and the increasing strong convection under the warming. So our model is so simple, but it's, it, it's able to capture such a, a, a similar, capture such a conclusions under the warming. Um, so, the, so this is about the histogram. So what we also do is we show, we plot the scatter plots. Here the X axis is for the precipitation amount under the current climate. Y axis is a precipitation amount on the future climate. If you still remember that, what do we do is we are using the pseudo global warming approach. What, do we, what it really means is for the current climate, we take the hourly environmental profile from the EIA 5, realness data. For the future climate, we use the same hourly environmental profile, but only adding a, a fixed mean climate perturbation project by simplified model. So each dot here, corresponding to the same hourly EIA-5 uh, environmental profile. Then its X value and the Y value corresponding to the precipitation amount under the current climate and the future climate. Now you can see here I overlap, overlap a, a red line here, Y equal to X line, meaning that if the dot sitting on those red line, it means that the, its precipitation amount will be equal under both current and future climate. Now, if you look at this scatter plot, you see a lot of dots is actually sitting above this y equal to x line, meaning that for those cases or those uh, environmental profiles, 
their future climate precipitation amount will be larger than the current climate precipitation amount. So there should be an increase in the precipitation. But the, that's, that is not the only feature. There also exist a lot of dots sitting on the x-axis. Those dots means that under the current climate, those environmental profile should have some precipitation amount. But uh, due to some, some kind of reason, they are surprised, those convection are suppressed, and uh, their uh, precipitation amount in the future climate is close to zero. So here's an interesting question. Why, under the global warming, some cases see precipitation increase, but the other cases is simply suppressed. The, there is no convection at all. Why this is totally so opposite results? In order to answer that, we further looking at uh, the, the two quantity, one is the cape, one is the same. So cape is the x-axis, uh, same is the y-axis. Here, uh, we, for simplicity, we're focusing on some sele uh, selected uh, uh, spots. So let's first look at the south green, uh, green plan uh, spot. So what we do is we are plotting a 2D histogram uh, about the cape. The, this is the most unstable cape and the most unstable thing. The color here shows you the frequency, occurring uh, frequency. So you can see that under the current climate, most of the cases has a moderate value for the cape, but a relatively small value for the sea. The bottom panel shows you the future change uh, for, for, the, uh, 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 for the histogram. And you can see under the future climate, those, uh, those, this histogram uh, sees some increase uh, in those regions. So those red regions means that they should have a much larger cape value. Also, they should have a much larger larger value for seeing. So in other words, at least for the, the spot at the South Great Plain, under the future warming, both Cape and the scene should increase. Um, so this can help us to answer the previous question because you know Cape is related to the convection intensity. So if you have some increasing Cape, you, you, we would expect that the, the, the convection will be become more intense in the future. That's why we see a lot of a situation, a lot of cases is sitting above the red, red curve and having a more precipitation under the warming. Meanwhile, if you see a larger scene, meaning that it, it becomes more difficult for the convection to be triggered. That's why some other cases, they are just uh, suppressed uh, uh, by the, uh, 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 under, under, the, under the warming. So, so I guess now this is a consistent to our argument. Since under the warming, you see much stronger thing, which will be likely suppress those weak to the moderate convection. But meanwhile, a strong convection, as long as they are triggered, they are tends to be even stronger. So by, by exploring the, the change in the cape and the scene, we're able to explain the, 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 these results. So just, I just want to give you a more direct impression why the keep and scene will increase under the warming. So here I borrow a figure from the Rasmussen's paper. As you can see here, the solid black line is for the, current, the, the, the environmental profile uh, from the current climate. And the, uh, this uh, gray curve is for the parcel uh, trajectory. You can see the red area shows the cape under the current climate. And if you look at the right-hand side, this red curve is for the future climate environmental profile, and this dashed uh, area is for the Cape in the future climate. Um, so if we want to, we do see, based on this diagram, we can see that the Cape does increase under the warming, but I think the more uh, essential reason for that is the slope of this moist adiabatic curve become uh, uh, slower. So in other words, this is what can be traced back to the CC relationship. Under the warming, the, the moist adiabatic uh, curve uh, or decreasing slope becomes smaller or slower. That's why this area or the cape, cape value should increase under the warming. And, but uh, for the same, it's a little bit harder to explain because they are, it's very hard to tell from this diagram. And I think uh, uh, a hand weaving explanation is we know under the warming, the relative humidity, especially over the land region, will decrease. It, it will become relatively dry environment. So if the relative humidity uh, decrease under the warming, then it will become harder for the parcel to reach saturation. You, you need to go to a slightly higher level to reach the level of uh, uh, 
uh, uh, lifting condensation level as well as the uh, level of free convection. That's why the seam should also increase. So this is a very brief uh, explanation about the results, why keep and the seam would increase under the warming. So next, I'm also show the results f uh, for other spots. For example, for the North Grey plant, you see the key, the, this, uh, uh, um, so this map shows you, basically tells you that uh, over the North Grey plant, seam should increase, but there's not much difference for the cape. And for the Northeast, you see a similar uh, feature as the uh, South Grey plant. You see an uh, eastward shift and also the southward shift, meaning that there should be an increasing cape and an increasing seam. For the Southeast, similar features. So, it seems to me that such kind of change under the warming with increasing cape and increasing seam is very general or universal. So this is the, uh, uh, the end of the, my first part talk. It's about using the single column model to explain the change under the warming. But I, I, would, I, would, I would admit that such a single column model can only, capable, only be capable to describe a scattered convection. It's not directly related to MCS. We know that MCS is a much larger convection and it has a scale dependence. So in order to model that MCS, we need to further modify or improve, improve the model. So the part two is about MCS genesis stage in a multicolor Lagrange parcel model. Um, but before I show you uh, the derivation details, I want to emphasize another uh, fact that the form um, um, at all, they found out that based on the observation and simulation, cold pool can trigger convection. So the left panel shows you if the cold pool forms uh, due to the rate evaporation and the downdraft, when those cold air reach the surface and spread towards its neighboring area, it could trigger new convection due to the either mechanical lifting or the thermodynamic effect it can trigger new convection. But uh, also, if you have two cold pool which occur simultaneously, and uh, if the gas front collide with each other, and they, they can trigger even stronger convection due to the, uh, maybe by either mechanically or thermodynamically uh, effect. But the take home message is cold pool can trigger new convection. We want to incorporate such process into our model. Uh, by that definition, a multi-column model, basically we need to consider a 1,000 single column model and we align them together in, in an east-west direction. So here, there, in the multi-column model, we consider 1,000 model and a single column model and each single column model contains a parcel. And of course, if we do, don't do anything else, the solution will be very trivial because there's no interaction between the columns. So that's why we introduce the cold pool interaction mechanism. What we do is for each parcel, we assume that as long as they arise to beyond some threshold level, cold pool forms below and the two gas fronts will start to spread on the, uh, uh, along both directions. And so this green arrow is for the gas front from this cold pool and the purple one is for this cold pool. And if the two gas fronts from different cold pool collide with each other, we suppose it will it will apply very strong mechanical lifting effect to, to trigger the convection at, at this location. And also, so that's what we call the strong lifting effect due to the cold pool collision. And also, if there's a, a, a single gas front spread uh, from an isolated cold pool, we also assume that such kind of gas front can also apply a lifting effect and a weak lifting effect due to the gas front spreading. So the third mechanism is we also assume that if there's no convection, there's some weak subsidence effects because there's such a subsidence effect very important because this is the only mechanism in our model that can counter the, the triggering effect due to the cold pool. So this is the three mechanism we introduce into the multi-column model. Next, I just want to show you the output to give you an impression. How does the model output looks like? So this is a half mile diagram. Axis is the 1,000 kilometer. Each, column, each single column model is one kilometer in length. So there are 1,000 1, single column model aligned together in the east-west direction. And the vertical axis is for our from top to bottom. The color here, the, the gray scale shows you the height of the parcel from each single column model. You can see initially, we assume that those parcels are, uh, are distributed randomly. But after a few hours, you see that the, the, these multi-column multi model 
gradually forms a very large scale clusters. And such large scale cluster could, could be as large as more than 500 kilometers. There's another smaller uh, cluster formed on the right hand side. Such kind of uh, uh, aggregation effects looks like, uh, we assume this looks like the upscale growth feature, the so-called upscale growth feature associated with MCIS genesis. But uh, someone, if you are familiar with the so-called convective self-aggregation, this lo also looks, as, looks like a self convective self-aggregation. So here, I also run a, a RCE simulation by using the same model and uh, just run a se convective self-aggregation for comparison purpose. And here, still a um, uh, half a molar diagram, but here the, the, the color shows you the pre surface precipitation amount. And you can see for this convective self-aggregation, after about 20 days, you get a larger scale cluster on the left-hand side and a small one on the right-hand side. This looks quite similar. The only difference is in our model, based on solar laser copal mechanisms, the, the, this aggregation uh, rate is much faster than the, 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 the typical convective self-aggregation. So I guess our model is trying to emphasize that copal is a, a very important mechanism to promote the so-called upscale growth feature. But uh, um, next, I'm want to, I, I would like to highlight the copal interaction mechanism by running a few mechanism denial experiment. So what we do is the left panel is what you saw before. Right panel is, is I just remove one, one of them, one mechanism of them. So th this second panel shows that we switch off the strong lifting effect due to the copal collision. You can see without that lifting effect, it's totally uh, destruct, uh, 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 totally change the solution and there's no large scale cluster anymore. And if we switch off the weak lifting effects due to the gas from spreading, you still get those large scale cluster, but the, they become smaller and smaller. It seems they cannot maintain, maintain themselves anymore. And the, the last panel is for no subsidence. If you have no subsidence, no magnet mag to counter those triggering effects due to the lifting effects, then the convection will just prevail in the, over the whole domain. So I guess by doing this, uh, we want to emphasize that the, all the three copal related mechanisms are, are important and are necessary for the, 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 to getting those upscale growth feature. So this is a, just a sensitivity, sensitivity experiment about a two key parameters in the multi-column model. The first one is about the gas front speed. The second one is for the subsidence strength. So you can see if we, this is a histo di, uh, a diagram. When we increase the gas from speed, here we consider three different matrix. These, these are all different matrix to describe how large are the final uh, cluster size. And the first one, total area of copal. Second one, total number of convective column. Third one's average size of mesosphere cluster. You can see both blue, bar and the red bar, both copal and the mesosphere cluster keeps increasing when you have a larger gas front uh, speed. They make sense because if the, coast, uh, the gas front uh, goes faster, it tends to expand more faster. Then you tend to get, get a larger mesosphere cluster. This, uh, this is quite intuitive. But uh, also you can see the yellow bar doesn't change much. That is simply because Although the gas front can propagate very much faster, but it, it spends less time when they go across each specific column, so they will apply less lifting effects. So that's why the total number of combat column uh, doesn't change much. So this is a, just a sensitivity experiment when, when we vary the gas front propagating speed. So the second thing we want to do is we want to discuss the effects of subsidence strength. You can see, as you would expect, that when you increase the subsidence strength, all the three matrix decrease. That, that's very simple. You have a stronger uh, surprising effect. You surprise everything. And uh, it tends to have a smaller and less uh, convection uh, eventually. Um, so the reason I'm showing this sensitive uh, experiment is we found these two key parameters are very important to determine the final size of the mesosphere cluster. And if we want to apply such a model to discuss the uh, impact of global warming, we want to make sure these two key, key parameters are as realistic as possible. You can't just assign some value for them. You need to have a, find a better way to, uh, uh, to to get their value. So what we eventually do is we rely on the um, on cloud resolving simulation by running some warm bubble simulation. 
so here it's a, it's a 2D one bubble simulation, color showing, showing you the temperature anomalies. This is a gas front. So we run a, a, an ensemble one bubble simulation. We want to find the relationship between the gas front and the precipitation. And it turns out that what we found is gas front speed is more or less proportional to the early stage precipitation amount. This makes sense because you know those cold air in the in the leading edge of the cold pool is is coming down in the early stage. So if you have a more precipitation in the early stage, you get you are getting more cold cold air. Then those cold air in the leading edge of the cold pool should should move even faster. So that's the intuition behind. Then after we find this relationship, we try to fit the relationship between the gas front speed and the precipitation. So here is just one example to show you that our parameterization can actually capture the life cycle of uh, gas front speed. It will looks like this. So this is for, this, yeah. This is 2D simulation. 2D simulation, yeah. Right, right. So whether that has some impact, that's probably it does. Anyway, sorry for, for the interruption. Yeah. Uh, so the second part is about the uh, subsidence effects. So what we do is instead of those small domain, uh, one bubble simulation, now we are running some RCE simulation in a much slightly larger domain, 1,000 kilometers. And we want to find the relationship between the subsidence. By subsidence, subsidence we mean the downward velocity at the lower levels. We want to find the relationship between those downward velocity and the, those updraft speed. And uh, it turns out that what we found is subsidence strength below the two kilometer is proportional to the middle level uh, uh, compensating downdraft. You can see from this figure, they are more or less uniform, horizontally uniform, and it seems their value uh, is uh, proportional to each other. And the, we know that those middle level compensating downdraft is related to the updraft speed by uh, using the continuity equation or the conservation law of mass. When you have a faster updraft, you have a faster downdraft. So by using this relationship, we, we can come up with a parameterization for the subsidence strength. And here, I just want to show you how good is such kind of subsidence strength. X axis is the true subsidence, subsidence velocity we measured from the low level. Vertical axis is our parameterization, but uh, using the data from, from those simulations, the, the, the updraft speed. So now, by using the updraft speed and the number of combative columns, these scattered uh, dots shows you how good is this parameterization. If, we, if they stay on the y equal to x line, meaning that they, it's perfect. But it turns out that our parameterization is not bad. It's, it's staying close to this y equal to x line. So we would assume such kind of parameterization is good enough for us to investigate the impact of global warming. So this is my last, slide, my, uh, the, my last results. Here, what I'm going to show you is the left three panel is for the three matrix I just mentioned before. Top panel for co total cold pool area, second panel total convective column number, third is average mass scale cluster size. Maybe we can just focus in on the, this cluster size. And here, we consider different scenario. Current means the, 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 the average cluster size under the current climate. And this light blue is under the warming. So you can see that our multicolor model predict that under the warming, the mesosphere cluster size should decrease. But why is that? We can further go to look at the, um, the, the, those uh, uh, details in the solution. And we find out that compared with, this is for gas front speed. The dark blue is for current climate. Compared with current climate, the future climate, the global warming scenario, sees much slower uh, gas front speed. But that, why is that? I just write down the, the road map. When you, under the warming, when we have a, 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 a decreasing environmental relative humidity under the warming, then it, we tend to have a smaller early stage precipitation amount. Then, as if you still remember, early stage precipitation will decide the gas front speed. So you tend to have a slower gas front speed. So if you have a slower speed, the, the cold pool expands slower and it becomes smaller eventually. So that's, the, that's why mesoscale cluster decrease. And this is just from the gas front speed. The bottom panel is for the subsidence stress. So you can see compared with current climate in the dark blue one, the light blue one under the warming is slightly larger than that. 
This is, this is uh, uh, very easy to explain because under the future climate, you, we know there is an increasing cape. And the uh, increasing cape means that a more intense convection means that you have a larger uh, middle-level updraft and downdraft, then you tend to have a stronger subsidence strength. Then you have, when you have a stronger subsidence, it tends to suppress more convection, and that, that's why mesosphere cluster decrease. So this is uh, the two roadmap to explain why our multi-column model would predict that the mesosphere cluster size should decrease under the warming. But of course, under, in the reality or, or, or in the observation, or, or, uh, Global warming, it does not mean it's just a change in the environmental temperature and moisture. There may be also some change in other conditions. For example, if you have a more moist boundary layer, you can still get a larger mass scale cluster size. That, that's the green bar. And if in, under the warming, convection tends to last longer, then you can still get a larger mass scale cluster size. And the red bar is the, the case. If you see much stronger mechanical lifting effect, say under the future uh, warming scenario, you have a more uh, uh, eastward moving disturbance from, from the west, then those disturbance can provide more stronger lifting effects. All these scenario can give you totally opposite results with increasing mass scale cluster size. So I guess what we try, try to say is by using this multi-column model, we are able to investigate the scenario one by one and give you different results based on different scenarios. So that's all, uh, all the results I have. Uh, this is a br very brief summary. Uh, by using the, building a single column model, we are able to predict the mean precipitation decrease over the central US in agreement with simplify projection. And by using a single column model, we are able to predict a decrease in weak to the moderate precipitation events, but an increase in the strong ones. And by building the multi-column models, we are able to predict that uh, M MCS size decrease under the warming, but it can still increase under the favorable conditions. Here's the two literatures uh, I, I mentioned today. And uh, if you got interest, uh, please have a look at that. And uh, I guess that's the end of my talk. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks very much, Chow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's open it up to questions either via Slido or in the room. And I have the mic, so if anyone has a question, I'll walk over. So, uh, of course, there is PGW simulations of continental US done at NCAR. Have you compared your results? I don't think they, there is any contradiction. I mean, maybe. Andreas can, can uh, say something on that, but I think uh, that's the one step that, that is missing. And then the other comment, if I may, right away, if you get 1,000 columns, it's almost like cloud resolving models. Uh, you know, with thousand, if you get 1,000 single column models, it's like a cloud resolving model already. Uh -huh. So why bother? Why don't run 2D cloud resolving model? You get all the physics, in fact, more complicated physics with microphysics, yep. gravity waves, cold pool spreading. Yep. The physics is there. You can do those two, two simulations, and I've done it in the past, and I'm sure you know, yep. with large two dimensional domain, and you see the physics that is already there. So uh, basically, sorry to sound unfair, but you know, why? That's my, my question, why? Uh -huh. Sorry, oh. Andreas. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, well, I, I like your comments. And uh, for the first one, uh, comparison with the uh, 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 other convection permitting models, I agree. That is a missing piece from our studies. I surely want to do that, uh, but I didn't do that yet. Uh, I agree. For the second comments, uh, well. I'm not saying that those chlorosome models is, is not useful. It is definitely useful. But you know, in the chlorosome model, there are so many different processes. How do you know that different processes are competing or uh, they have the similar effects? So by doing this, our main purpose is we want to isolate the dominant mechanism. So like here, we want to emphasize Copo is a, is a key player. We want to see. Yeah, want to, that for Sorry. yeah but uh, for this uh, uh, upscale growth feature, 
Yeah, so another comment. Before you started talking about multi-column, mm -hmm. I thought that this single-column uh, application would be actually something nice to try in kind of a low-resolution climate or low-resolution regional climate model, yeah. just to make sure that it does what it's supposed to do. If you do it on a, let's say, 20-kilometer grid hydrostatic uh -huh. model, uh -huh. then you will some of the mechanisms that you're talking about should be kind of modeled. I mean, presumably, I would hope that your simple 1D uh, model is better than any other convection scheme because it has uh -huh. some kind of temporal evolution, it has yeah, precipitation yeah. falling out. So that would be, to me, a very interesting avenue before you go having thousands of those columns, which <laughs> to me is just having kind of a you know very simple convection permitting model, if you like. So uh, mm -hmm. maybe that's a suggestion for, for mm -hmm. what you can do next using mm -hmm. this simple approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Did you want to respond, Andy? So the, the the warm bias that we the, we have problems in the model, as you showed at the beginning, we have this warm bias in the central US. So I'm not sure if what the the climate change signals that we get are really reliable because we are only able to simulate one kind of MCS, which are often more frontally baroclinically forced. Later summer, August, September, MCSs are in way weaker environments, and those we don't do very well. So. Yeah, this is the land surface problem. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we have new simulations that are much better simulating the central US. And it's really this land atmosphere coupling, the relative humidity change that you're mentioning. That's a critical component about how the future of MCSs in the central US will look like, mm -hmm. I think. Hi, uh, first, that was a really nice presentation. I enjoyed it. And um, my question is, is not really what, um, what, what you were showing here, but in your very first slide where you showed the dry buyers of the, over the central US, yeah. there was a, a moist bias over the eastern US. Do we know why that is, where that comes from? <laughs> I know it's not your topic at yeah, all. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I don't all know. Right. Thank you. Well, yeah. Oh, your lecture is about understanding the mechanisms of uh, these things, and my question is a little bit on the border of your lecture. So uh, this connection between warming and precipitation change, is it possible to, um, uh, to, to state that in a statistical significant way? You mean uh, warming and uh, dry? Warming and moisture, I mean, precipitation, I mean, you had that. That is the background of it all. But um, I understand you you have some mechanism and, and yeah, know yeah. and can understand its possible mechanisms of it. Yeah. But the fact itself, is there a connection between warming and it's, of course, very important. Uh, but can you establish this fact in a statistically significant way? So what what we show here, it's although it's not not a very large sample, but the, what we show here is actually the result average over uh, four different four different four simulation uh, with different initial conditions. So it's not just a single simulation. We initialize the simulation with different initial random conditions and the average of the the the, the, the massive scale cluster size. So this difference we suppose it's... Yes, you see yeah. uh, an ensemble, but the yeah. question is um, you could have a bias of it all. And um, I mean, my question is just, do are you convinced you already have shown uh, that uh, this connection is, is there? I mean, statistically significant, or do you think there are experiments we could be done, I mean, uh, with full general circulation models or things like that? That is my question. Uh, is it, can we rely on it? Is it statistically significant? Uh, uh, in, in terms of the observation or in terms of in which aspect? In, uh, only no, in mean, my that is model, the, model. The prediction that when it becomes warmer at certain places, yeah, yeah. it becomes drier. 
or, or moisture at other places. This prediction, is that a reliable prediction? Can you say? Uh, or, or is there still um, more work to be done to, uh, to, to, to establish this connection? Well, I, well, I remember, I, I noticed you mentioned the mean, the dry, the, the decrease, the mean precipitation decrease. Yes. Such a kind of result is also found based on the Wolf simulation, 14 years simulation, pseudo global warming for future. Yes, and I understand it's found. Yeah. But do the model say this in a statistical significant way? For example, if it's a weather forecast, you can hit it in a 10 day forecast. But the weather forecast in statistically is not valid in 10 days. So is this forecast over many decades valid? Are uh, you sure about it, or is it just a simulation? I, I would say I'm not sure about that. Based on your, your comments, I'm not sure about that. So this is, a, for my best understanding, it's purely based on the simulation, uh, single wolf simulation, those convection permitting simulation. Of course, there should be some uncertainty returns the magnitude, how, how large is the dry bias. But the, the qualitatively description, there should be a dry bias, such kind of results, I believe it's, it's certain enough. But that, oh. there's some uncertainty about the magnitude. Okay, we'll just uh, squeeze in two more questions, one here and then one over there. So um, yes, CC Chen asks, uh, yeah, thank you for a great talk. Maybe I missed it. Are the Lagrangian parcels advected horizontally? Yeah. Um, uh, another... Yeah, I, I can say that. Uh, so the model doesn't include any uh, uh, wind or circulation. So it's, the parcel just stay at the same place. Uh, so it's not advected by horizontally. Uh, they stay in the same column. Now the question is, multi columns, it's 2D. Uh, yeah, so I, I think uh, this 2D, we do the 2D simply for the sake of simplicity. Uh, to have a better compar comparison, we should build a 3D model. And I would expect a 3D scenario, we may give us more interesting results. It may give us some other interesting results. So that's why in the next stage where we want to pursue this direction building okay. a 3D one, now, presumably uh, it could be getting some other interesting results. Okay, yep. final comment. I'll be quick since it's getting to be close to three. Um, going back to your simple Lagrangian parcel model before you talked about the, the uh, aggregation part, um, presumably there's a lot of parameters in that model, but I didn't really hear you talk too much about how those were determined and maybe the sensitivity to that. I'm thinking of things like the entrainment rate. Uh -huh. the, uh, you have to give the, uh, some boundary condition, like some initial lift uh, to the parcel before it hits the LFC, so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, well, we, um, so the, the, there are, are some parameters like entrainment rate and the lifting distance and uh, like the atmosphere drag coefficient. We, we pick those uh, values, uh, honestly speaking, from the original uh, ROMs and uh, Zhiming Kuang's paper, and uh, we keep them at the same value. It doesn't change, change their value throughout the whole study. Yeah. Okay, well. If I recall, their, their paper was actually for tropical convection, right? Right, right. So it's a little bit a little different regime, but that's, that's different. interesting. Then, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we're, we're out of time. Please stick around for refreshments, everyone, and let's thank Chow again. Thank you.